Welcome back to uh, Preaching Through Second Peter. Uh, once again, I am Michael John, pastor of the Mark Street Baptist Church in Amesbury, Massachusetts. I'm Kevin Leach, the pastor of Woodland Presbyterian Church in Woodland, Washington. And we are continuing our series through Second Peter. We're looking in Second Peter chapter 2. Last time we began breaking down this paragraph, uh, verses 4 through 10a, and we discussed just that first verse 4. Today we're going to look at verse 5. Uh, that's it. Um, and then next week we'll try to finish it up. But let's go through it one more time. I think it, to get the full context, we would need to read verses 1 down to 10a. So Kevin, would you do the honors and, and read that for us? Sure. The false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into chains, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was, torment, uh, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Great, thanks. We're looking at today at verse five. Last time we talked about the, the angels who sinned, and today we're going to be looking at verse five about how God preserved Noah uh, in the ancient world. But we don't want to lose the forest for the trees. So right. once again, let's, let's, let's come back to the main point of this passage. He's talking about false teak prophets. Uh, that rose among the people and warning us against them. What's the point, Kevin, of this whole paragraph here, verses four through 10? What's the main point we don't want to miss? Well, he's, he's dealing with a situation where uh, they have false teachers in their midst, and Peter is addressing that whole issue to a people who are um, being wooed by these false teachers to go in the way of unrighteousness and wickedness and, and uh, sinful desires and all of it, to give in to all of that. And he is reminding them of the fact that, uh, that God is coming and he's bringing his judgment. And therefore, what's going to happen in the judgment day uh, if you either follow the false prophets or you listen to the message of, of the, the apostles? And so verse 9 comes down to it. Um, that's really the message, isn't it? Yes. Uh, if all of this happens, if, if in the past God has judged and judged those who have done evil uh, and, and even, you know, say no one lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. He's speaking to them now in the here and now. He knows how to rescue us from trials and also to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Yeah, that's great. And we remember that the breakdown of the past is the grammar. And what's amazing about this paragraph is one sentence is what it is. This whole mm -hmm. paragraph from four to 10 is just that's one right. Sentence. Yeah. And it, it's this if then clause, if mm -hmm. God did not spare the angels, uh, if he did not spare the ancient world, mm -hmm. if by turning Sodom, the city of Sodom to ashes, condemning them to extinction and if he rescued like righteous lot yeah um then he knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment each of those stories it's really i think two stories in two parts yeah not sparing the angels and not sparing the ancient world but preserving noah right turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah to ashes and rescuing lot mm -hmm. and he knows how to rescue the godly uh and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment he he gives us this big perspective. And he goes back to the ancient world to do that. So 
we want to zero in. Last time, again, we talked about the angels who've sinned, and you can review that on our other podcast. But this time, verse 5, we're going to look at the ancient world and preserve Noah, a herald of, un, of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So we'll start with this idea of what the ancient world. Let's talk about what was going on in the ancient world during the times of Noah. Yeah. Kevin, you want to start us off with that? What was happening? Sure. Um, well, um, it's, it's really important to go back to how it describes. And so if you go back to what I did is I, I look back in Genesis chapter six, verses five, and then 11 and 12, because that's a, that's just a description of what was going on. Of course, it, it follows along what we saw last week, you know, with the, the angels and, and their sinning. And, you know, um, if you remember, we looked at Enoch and what Enoch had to say, because it seems as if Peter and Jude were both, yeah. um, both referring to that, that, uh, Enoch passage or that uh, Genesis 6 passage. So this is what it says. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of the hearts of his heart was only evil continually. And then verse 11 and 12. And now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had, a, had corrupted their way on the earth. So there's a description of what life was like in Noah's day. Yeah. The ancient world, there's a, there's a theme developed here too. I want to add one more verse to that. Yep. In verse four is in those days, the Nephilim yep. were on the earth in those days. And afterward, when the sons of God came to the doors of men, they brought children to them. These were the mighty men of old, who yep. were of old, the men of renown. And the word Nephilim in some versions is giants, um, these, these are mysterious creatures. Are they the, the product of the sons of God and the daughters of men? It's not clear. It just says they were on the earth in those days. But I think the main point is that the mighty men of old, the men of renown. So there seem to be like three parts to this ancient world. The, they are the, the mighty men, the proud, the men of renown, the heroes, the Hercules, the, the, the Marvel superheroes. And then their wickedness, as you mentioned, was great. The thoughts of their heart were only evil all the time yeah and then the other part which you mentioned was that that the earth was corrupt and the earth was filled with violence yeah so i kind of summed that up as looking at their uh their big heads bad hearts bloody hands that's <laughs> I got the fastest way to put it together like for that. there. <laughs> so, um, but there's this uh and i i want to what's fascinating is it's these three do not seem to go together in our minds oftentimes because we think of the men, the mighty men of renown as something noble and something glorious and something wonderful that, that we admire. Uh, and then it moves to things that are evil and violent, yeah. but they go together. They're all yeah. together here. The pride and the lusts of their hearts and the, the violence that, that would fill the earth because of them, their selfish ambitions, it all goes together. Mm -hmm. so that's the ancient world and the the point he makes about the ancient world is oh one other thing before we get to that i want to add a few things to it as well if you go back this is nothing new uh if you go back to genesis 4 yeah you have cain and abel mm -hmm. he's the really the founder of the ancient world and he's the one who kills his brother abel there's the violence once again. And then his interaction with the Lord, you see his wicked, deceitful heart. And then when he goes off, after he leaves and kicked out, he builds a city. Right. And names it after his son. And then yeah. his descendants do have all these great achievements. Right. Yeah. Instruments and weapons and music and livestock. They're really advanced. And these are, again, these are the entrepreneurs. These are the great ones that we admire. Yeah. And then we see it again in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Their pride, making a name for themselves, and then um, being scattered after that and cursed. So, yeah, go ahead. And, and you know, uh, along with that, at the end of that um, chapter four, uh, what do we see? Um, we see uh, Lamech, right? And, uh, and what's he doing? Well, he's continuing on in that same vein. You know, it's just the violence and 
Yeah. The boasting, but the, the, we have to get that. If we talk about violence, we're not, we're not talking about, you know, people sneaking in alleys, murdering people. Right. We are talking about the kind of violence we admire and the kind of power and strength that is an inspiration to us. The, the taking life by the throat and getting what you want. Right. Pursuing it. And these, this is the ways of the giants. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it, it's, it continues today. You know, we, we, we do look at, look at our heroes and oftentimes are the ones who have made a name for themselves, but what have they, what have they had to do in order to make that name in order to have the things that they have, you know? And so while we celebrate the rich and the powerful, uh, we, we overlook the very things that got them there. You know, it's interesting, there's coming back to the false teachers, there is a, a quality that I've seen in a lot of the false teachers, especially in the prosperity gospel, is the bigness and the loudness of them. They are, mm. like, they present themselves like giants, um, that they are, mm. they are just these so admired, so, but, and some of them even physically, just like are, they look like professional wrestlers, some of these guys, mm -hmm. and they come out there and the voices, they, they talk like professional wrestlers too, <laughs> you know, in the microphone, they really present themselves like giants because they know people love that we yeah. we are always looking for people to look up to and they present themselves in these big ways like the ancient world yep yep exactly so then he talks about the, the we know what happened to the ancient world he says how they were destroyed by the flood they're destined for that destruction but let's let's talk about noah he says in our passage in second peter he had mentioned he says this about noah how god preserved noah and let's see, verse five, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So he seems to emphasize a couple things with Noah, that he's a herald of righteousness and that he is preserved with his family, with seven others, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Right. What does he mean by a herald of righteousness? In what way is Noah a herald of righteousness? Um, so, so Noah, uh, Noah, and, and it doesn't, there's, there's nothing in the scriptures that tell us that he was a preacher of righteousness. Yeah. Um, there are some, uh, some descriptions of him, like in, in, um, Josephus, I think there's yeah. a description of him as a preacher of righteousness. Um, I think in first Clement, uh, was another, um, writing that talks about him in the same vein. Um, so, so what are they, re what's, what's being referred to here in terms of a preacher of right righteousness? What, it, so I think Peter probably is, is again, just like uh, we saw last week, he's taking that, um, the, what was being um, taught about, about um, Noah in Jewish circles that was very familiar to his readers, perhaps, and so that's part of it. Um, but the other thing is um, that there, you can, you can imagine. Here is Noah living in this, uh, living in his this ancient world in the days of evil and all of that. And uh, for that 120 years, he's building the ark. And imagine the opportunities he has, as as uh, people come to him, uh, wondering what he's doing. And uh, he has that um, has those opportunities to talk about what God has said. Yeah. Thus saith yeah. the Lord. The judgment is coming. Mm. And yet, what we notice is that not one person outside of his family. Yeah. Comes responds. Up. Yeah. The, the 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 fascinating thing about Noah, I think he's quoting, he's referencing uh, Genesis six, nine, and ten. Mm -hmm. which speaks about Noah as a righteous man. Yes. Yep. The herald of righteousness, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. Right. And then it mentions his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So his family. So, so Genesis 6 references Noah's character and his family. Mm -hmm. and that's all that we know of Noah in that text up until the flood. We get some, some information about him after the flood and during the flood. But before then, all we know is yeah, no great achievements. There's no battles that he won. He's not a great warrior. We don't know anything about how big he was, anything like this. We just know his character. He's a righteous man. Mm -hmm. 
blameless in the generation. He's, he's different from everybody else. And he walked with God. And then, uh, and I, I would say that phrase from Micah, where he says to what does the Lord require of you, but to walk humbly with your God. I think that's yeah. the, the context here. It's not just that he's hanging out with God, like their buddies, but this is humble walking with him, attending in, to his word. In faith, right? Mm -hmm. Just trust, trust in what God has said yeah. and, and being faithful in that. Yeah. And this is how he finds favor in the Lord. Yeah. It, not because he accomplished anything, but because he walked with God, he believed yeah. the faith. And then he has just this small family of three, three, three sons and their wives, and that's it. So there's eight of them. And so you really see the, the contrast, the entire ancient world, these giants mm -hmm. of and these huge crowds and the loud noises and all the great achievements uh, versus this is one old man and his three sons. And again, remember, I think Noah's like 500 years when he enters the ark yeah. Or, yeah. or 600 years when he enters the ark. Uh, this old man and his three sons. And it's amazing that his sons are, and their wives are, um, they've got to be a bit old there too. They've got to be like hundreds of years old and they don't have any kids yet. <laughs> so yeah. this old family, looks like some of our churches. This old <laughs> <laughs> kids. <laughs> And there's eight of them, small, old, and uh, and there's no hope for for any future here. And that's the the contrast could not be any greater than this. Uh, and here we have, but we know what happens that that after the flood, the flood changes everything. Yeah, the flood wipes away the giants, and it sets up Noah and his sons to inherit the earth. Um, so who has the future? Not the strong and the mighty and the loud, but the humble, and the faithful and the right. small. So. And that, or that really is the message of Second Peter, isn't it? Yeah. Just seeing this over and over again. Uh, that's, that's the encouragement that Peter is giving his readers. That's the encouragement that the Lord is giving us in, in this, is that, that we, are, um, we are to be humble, um, dedicated followers of Christ, trusting in him, what he's promised, regardless of what the world looks like, uh, sounds like around us, regardless of all the, um, all the temptations that come our way to follow the, 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 or to hear and heed the voices of those who tell us mm -hmm. he's not coming again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Live however you want. Uh, enjoy this day. Um, best life now kind of, kind of message. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit more about that. Coming back to our text here, really, you, I think you see in this story of Noah when you examine it, uh, the two ways to live, the two mm -hmm. theology. Now, Martin Luther had a phrase for it. He said, "There's the theology of glory, and the theology of the cross." And the false mm -hmm. teachers are really all about the theology of glory. And if you would maybe explain a little bit about what Luther meant by that, the theology of glory, what were they teaching? Um, well, the, the false teachers are teaching um, that, uh, again, uh, you can have your best life now. That's what you're to go after. Um, it's all about what, what you want in this world, um, and um, you just have to go after it or name it and claim it and you know, all yeah. of that. And, uh, and it is really, um, especially when we live in times where that's the easy way to go. It's, there's, there's such a temptation to fall into that. Uh, to, if, if, um, you know, if, if money is, we think money is going to bring us happiness or ease is going to bring us happiness. Uh, and it's, that's the way, that's the easy way to go. And that's the message that's being given to us over and over again. Uh, you yeah, talk yeah. about um, you talk about um, Martin Luther. It reminded me of a sermon I heard um, Joseph Stoll preach one time, and he was talking about the um, the um, upper room mm -hmm. and the washing of the Jesus washing the feet. And he talked about the difference between the um, the title and the towel. Yeah, kind of the same thing. Mm. You know, are we seeking glory? Or are we seeking service? You know, service of Christ. Yeah, that's a good word. You know, the, uh, I look at the, the two most common false teachings in America right now, depending on what region you're in. If you're in the red states, it's the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. Conservative places, we love that. We're looking to, to have our best life now, to achieve wealth and, and health and to have success in this life. And that's the focus. It's always on this life, health and sex. They don't really 
spend much time on eternal life. That's a, that's a footnote. Oh, yeah, by the yeah. way, you could have eternal life too if you believe in Jesus. But the main emphasis of the preaching is right now. Right now, we want to see blessings and healing and success and so forth. That's a very common one in the red state. In the blue states like ours, it's, it's, the, it's the social gospel. It's yeah. about us making the world a better place. The emphasis is still on this world, though. It's still on, uh, on bringing in sort of this utopia that we've longed for peace on earth and we can all be one and, and finally fulfill the, the vision of that great prophet, um, John Lennon. You know, yeah, imagine. World, right? Yeah. But it's, and, it's, and it's still focused on us. Yeah. You know, both the messages are focused on us. Exactly. And that's what's amazing about it is like the, the, the people, typically the people who love the prosperity gospel are more conservative. The people who love the, the social gospel are more liberal and they typically hate each other. And yet they're both in a sense playing for the same team because it's still a this world yeah. gospel. It's about yeah. this world now having, you know, seeing God, seeing things happen in this world, making this world, building our own towers. And they are, you know, giant figures, either loud, obnoxious giants like professional wrestlers or mystical giants, you know, like your Gandhis and your people who mm -hmm. are just like of otherworldly, you know, folks, spiritual giants. It's still the same basic message um, that it's about working for ourselves in this world. Yeah. You contrast that, as you mentioned, with the, with the theology of the cross and the example in the upper room and of Christ taking the servant's place. So how does the, the true gospel differ from that false gospel that is so so abundantly proclaimed everywhere. Yeah, well, the, the true gospel is, is Christ. I mean, this is what Peter started off with, and uh, in chapter one really stressed um, is that uh, it's, it's the exact opposite, you know, and so there's, there's, being, there's this contrast that's being made between what the false teachers are bringing us and the message that Christ has brought us, and that's to trust in him, to um, humbly follow him, to to uh, to grow in him um, and, and uh, to do that more and more as uh, as that day approaches and uh, it's just a, a completely different message it's not about um, it's not about gaining fame or power or um, prestige or uh, big bank accounts but it's about serving Christ humbly in this world yeah. and it's 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 not a message that appeals in our world it appeals to people in our world if, if if we're if this if we're this world based you know if this is what it's all about this is not an appealing message message of the cross not at all and i would say you know this is what jesus talks about is the narrow way versus the yeah. wide way least destruction and we're not saying that you know we are not about people getting healed or mm -hmm. that god doesn't do miracles today and it doesn't mean that we're not about doing good works to try to make the world a better place, but that that's not the heart of the gospel that we're proclaiming. It's not about signs and wonders and making the world a better place. It's about trusting in Christ yeah. and finding our salvation and looking to the cross and being forgiven and reconciled to God and then loving one another. And that's small ways and small little things. And and leaving it to the Lord to make the world the better place, leaving it to the Lord and his good timing to do miracles if he so pleases, yeah. but not calling him down from heaven, but simply trusting him like Noah. There's a sort of walking with God. Um, there's a quietness about this that yeah. is not inspiring. It's, it's even boring. Yeah. It's interesting. Noah's name is a pretty boring name too. It means rest. It's like, just take a nap. Just go to sleep here. Giving us rest. Uh, you know, but but for people who are tired and are weary of this world, that's a gospel that's very appealing. And I think, yeah. you know, that's sort of where we're called to. If you're looking for action, adventure, inspiration in that way, you're going to be drawn to the giants. Yeah. But if you're, if you're weary of your own sin and looking for forgiveness and rest, um, the gospel is the only thing that will satisfy and will make sense. Yeah. Be still and know that I'm God. You know, yeah. Yeah. and and really, it's um, it's the contrast is between um, seeking glory and bringing glory. You know, seeking glory for ourselves or bringing glory to God. Yeah, yeah. That's 
Well, one last thing, just maybe wrap it up for us here. How, how what's your application? Uh, how are you going to apply this text to your church? Um, you know, I'm I'm going to talk a lot about um, how um, there is uh, we can expect opposition in this world um, when we follow Christ. We can expect opposition, and so what will we do in the face of opposition? And it's kind of what. Um, uh, what the author of Hebrews in chapter 12 gets at. You know, what, what do we do when we face opposition? Well, we remember um, the, the great cloud of witnesses, and we look to Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, and he goes on to say, um, looking to Jesus, founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despising same shame, and is seated on the right hand of the throne of God. Mm. And so in, in the midst of, um, and I think he goes on to talk about the opposition, you know, this is what we're to do. And so just, a, um, you know, a reminder to us that we're to, um, in the midst of this opposition, we're not to give, give in to it and give up, but uh, we're to pursue Christ. And so that's, that's really, um, you know, in, in the passage, you talk about Jesus uh, talking about the, the wide way that leads to destruction and the narrow way, enter the narrow gate. And, uh, and that really is the message here. Yeah. For us. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be uh, tying this passage into Matthew seven, when Jesus warns about false prophets, again, kind of bringing back to the main point of this, the reality that there are false prophets and false teachers everywhere. And like the ancient world, there are huge crowds following them. These are the giants. And the first warning we get in, in that section is, you know, don't follow the crowds because the wide way leads to destruction. And I would say, don't follow the giants, these, these great men. He says there are that many that will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do wonders and signs in your name? And he says, you know, away from me, you evildoers. He has no use for them, even though they did it in his name and miracles. So don't be impressed by the signs, the wonders, the giants. Don't be overwhelmed by these guys and don't don't assume that because they're great crowds that they're in the right place mm -hmm. and that because you know your church is boring and your crowds are small that you're in the wrong place like, you know that that has nothing to do with it either way you cannot measure anything by the crowds and by the giants but rather you examine the fruit he says yep. you know, how do you know the tree you know it by its fruit you don't know it by its size or by the leaves by the fruit that's all that matters and some of the yeah. ugliest trees give the best fruit and some of the greatest grandest trees are worthless yeah it's like you know, that's what we're looking at is what is the fruit and the fruit is not the words and the works of these guys the great yeah. miracles and signs and wonders that they claim the fruit is as we know is what peter told us back in yeah. chapter one and we'll kind of finish up with that thought he says what's the fruit it's about faith and adding faith, virtue, and yeah. knowledge, and self-control, and steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. It's, as Paul says, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself in love. Yeah, and, and to, to point out, this is not our fruit in the sense that this is the fruit of Christ in us, right? And so this is, this is Christ in us. These are the qualities that, that Christ, uh, through the Spirit, gives us. And so, it, it, again, it's not about our glory. It's about his glory. Yeah. You know, you're in the company of heaven when there is genuine faith and humble trust in the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and genuine love for one another. That's how you know you're in the company of heaven. My, my dad, I want to close. My dad had a saying that uh, um, to help kind of help us remember this. He says, you know, the devil can do just about anything. He can do signs and wonders. He can even preach the most stirring sermons and say the most awesome prayers. He can wear the robes. He can do all those things. There's just one thing the devil cannot do. He cannot love. Hmm. And I would add to that, he cannot trust Christ either. Yeah, yeah. So faith and love are not things he can do. And that's the side, that's the test. And yep. so as you examine your preachers and the people that you want to support and, and get connected with, I mean, these are the folks you want to do. And what's amazing about it is the Noah's are often inconspicuous in this world and you don't find them in the pulpits but oftentimes you find them in your pews right next to you mm -hmm. genuine faith and love and these are folks we should encourage and uh and imitate 
yeah. not the guys on TV. So, yeah. And that I really, I think this passage needs to be um, seen as an encouragement, uh, just a real encouragement for people to continue on, be persevere. And um, even when it seems like we're losers, yeah. Uh, and that's the way it will seem like in this world. Uh, I, I just think of, you know, our church had to take a stance um, uh, before I came, but they took a stance um, on the word of God. And because of that, it brought a lot of sorrow. Mm. Um, and that's the way it is sometimes. Yeah. You know, there's sorrow in this world. There's tribulation in this world. But uh, we're, we're um, heartened um, because of what Christ has promised, that he has overcome the world. So, Amen. Amen. Well, that's a great place to end. So next week, we'll be taking on uh, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. That should be an interesting discussion as well. But we're glad that you could join us and hope that you catch us next time as well. God bless. Thanks.